What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Danny and Bush coming at you with the final installment of our early round draft strategy series. We've done picks one through four. That video is doing really well. Appreciate the support on that. We did picks five through eight, which just went live about yesterday. If you guys want to check that one out. But if you are picking at the end of the draft, like I am picking in my home league, and you guys can see my trophy poking out in the corner behind me, I'm picking ninth overall. This is the video for me. So you can best be rest assured that I have done my research on this area of the draft. So if you guys enjoy this video at any point, like, comment, subscribe. Danny, how are you doing today? Doing well, doing well. And yeah, in my one home, like I had the 110. So I guess we got shit out of luck in terms of our actual draft order luck. And uh, you one to four guys got the luxury of watching your video a couple days ago, but you nine to 12 grinders, I believe in you. And this is how you attack your drafts. And this is how you beat those Christian McCaffrey teams by following these strategies on today's video. So I'm happy, I'm excited, and I'm ready to roll, man. Yeah, let's get into it. We're not going to waste any time. Let's hit the intro and we're going to get right into this. Okay, so as always, if you guys watch the other two videos, you know that we talked about what our general strategy is first. Now, this is the most flexible area of the draft, and I think you agree with me as well, because in the first uh, couple picks, we believed that Hero RB pretty convincingly was the best strategy to adopt because of all the mock drafts and all the underdog drafts that we've done this summer. We understand who is going to generally be in that area of the draft on the 2-3 turn. We realize that it's usually not elite upside running back, so you're better off going wide receiver, tight end type area in that draft. And then obviously rounds 4, 5, 6, and 7, we know that you never want to be taking running backs in that area of the draft. So with this 9 through 12 range, there's a number of different directions you can go. So we talked about in the 1 to 4 video, the logic and the rationale behind going with Hero RB. On a similar note, Jack Miller says that teams that started RBRB, RB, so you go with a two running back start and then took their RB3 after round six. So you go RBRB, RB, then you avoid that running back dead zone by taking wide receivers, taking maybe a tight end, maybe a quarterback. They averaged a high win rate, a 9.6% win rate, which is over 1% better than average. It's undeniably prolific to get an anchor RB or two and then load up on the other positions. So the approach that I am hopefully going to adopt in my home league at the ninth pick will be an RBRP approach. I'll let you explain kind of a wide receiver, wide receiver approach because you took it in your home league, but that is the approach that I am most likely going to be heading into my draft with. Yeah, for sure. And I just want to quickly outline, somebody probably hears, oh, 9.4%, like, like, how is that good? But if you guys actually do the math here, 12-person league, every person on paper should have about an 8.3% chance of winning. And so if you can get a competitive edge, over 1% higher chance than the rest of your league, just from following a specific roster construction, it'll help you gain that edge. And I know I understand it. Everybody wants to hop into that micro analysis, that player X, V, player Y. But understanding, understanding the macro roster construction aspect of fantasy football is how you get that analytical edge that people may not even think of when you're in your home league drafts. But yeah, you mentioned the wide receiver, wide receiver. I picked that the 110 in a full PPR league in my home league. I took Tyreek Hill at the 110, my second rated wide receiver after Devontae Adams off the board. The picks after that, I wanted one of three players, Travis Kelsey, Antonio Gibson, or Stefan Diggs, all three of the four next picks. So I adjusted. I went wide receiver, wide receiver. I thought the drop off after Antonio Gibson was steep enough to the point where I didn't want to force a running back pick. I didn't want to take a Joe Mixon. I didn't want to take a Clyde Edwards Hilaire. So I opted for opted for my number four overall wide receiver, and that was Calvin Ridley. Started Kyrie Kill, Calvin Ridley. Amari Cooper was able to fall to me in the third round. And I didn't plan going in. I was going to go full zero RB. But the way the board fell to me, listen, my three stack of wide receiver in a PPR league, Tyreek Hill, Calvin Ridley, and Amari Cooper already put me at a much more significant edge comparatively to the rest of my league in that regard. And uh, the, one at the, the guy at the seventh spot actually did a similar strategy to me. He went full zero RB to start as well. Similar trio with um, Devontae Adams, DeAndre Hopkins, and C.D. Lamb in his spot. So he did well as well. We kind of have to combat at the end of the day, that team that takes the Christian McCaffrey. And what better way to do so than getting the significant edge at the wide receiver position? Right. So we are going to head into some mock drafts. As always, if this is the first video that you guys are watching and you don't pick 9 to 12, go check out the other videos. We are basically going to do a mock draft where I pick 9, of course, because I'm picking 9 in my home league. So if anybody is watching this that is in my home league, I'm going to be very upset because I am about to show my entire hand right now. I'm going to show my entire strategy in the early round 
And that's unfortunate for me because, you know, I have a fantasy football YouTube channel, but that comes with the territory. So I'm going to be picking ninth. Danny's going to be picking 12th. Then we're going to head into another mock draft after this, the first eight rounds, picking 10 and 11. So let's get right into these mock drafts before we waste any more time. Okay, so you guys should see on the screen that Corey is, in fact, in that 9 slot, and I am rocking the 12. And then following this, I'll be rocking the 10 slot. Since I did that in my home league, Corey will be rocking the 11 spot. So let's kick it off. And again, as always, if we see two unrealistic of picks happen in front of Corey, we won't be afraid to adjust it to kind of give you a more realistic experience. Because although this is a macro theory type of video, the micro analysis does apply here if freaking... Alvin Kamara falls to Corey at the nine. Listen, that's not going to happen in your home leagues. And for damn sure, if it does happen in your home leagues, you take Alvin Kamara. So let's start this draft. I'm ready to kick it off. Uh, McCaffrey, Cook, Henry, Barkley. A pretty bog standard start, if I do say so myself. We actually see the classic thump the RB, boomer RB strategy with eight first picks being RBs. And Corey, are you going to follow the trend and go with an RB? Or are you going to take a wide receiver, a tight end in this spot. And I know exactly who you're going to pick, so it doesn't even matter. Yeah, so I'm assuming you know I'm going to pick Devontae Adams here, but let's just say I wasn't going to pick Devontae Adams. Now, currently, if I wanted to go running back, my highest rated running back is Aaron Jones. My second highest rated running back is Najee Harris. I could go in that direction and not be at too much of a disadvantage, in my opinion, because on the way back, my RB2 is going to be better than all of the top end uh, teams, Dalvin Cook, Christian McCaffrey, Derrick Henry teams their RB2. So I would be getting an advantage from that perspective, but the number one wide receiver is on the board. My number five overall players on the board and Devonte Adams. So I'm going to pick Devonte Adams. And again, if anybody from my home league is listening to this, if you guys take a bunch of running backs, at the beginning of the draft, like you did last year, I'm going to pick Devonte Adams this time. I'm not going to pick Clyde Edwards Hilaire like I did last year. Yep, for sure. And uh, my two highest rated players on the board right now, at the running back position is toss up with Aaron Jones. I fully get that. And I know the one pick for sure is going to end up being Travis Kelsey, my highest rated tight end, number six overall player in my rankings. The question that I have, though, is Stefan Diggs versus Aaron Jones. And that's a dilemma because at the end of the day here, my combination, in my opinion, of my number three wide receiver and my number uh, one overall tight end is probably going to give me a better advantage versus my number one tight end and my number seven running back. So as a result, it's tempting to go with Aaron Jones. I fully get it. I'm going to snag uh, Stefan Diggs here, not think twice. Right. See, and to me, I think the value would have been there for you to take Aaron Jones. Again, that's a personal thing. I know you have Diggs a little bit higher than me in your overall rankings. I have Diggs, I, I believe, at 11 in my overall rankings. And I think you have him at like seven or eight. So eight, that's yeah. kind of the difference in opinion there. I would have gone with Aaron Jones there, but I understand the move. And speaking of understanding the move, if this happens in my home league, I'm going to win. But I don't think it's going to happen because there's rumors that Najee Harris is going to go even before my first pick in uh, in my home league. but. Najee Harris is by far and away the far, uh, the highest rated player on my board right now. Calvin Ridley, the second closest uh, guy, I think he's at 13 and I have Najee Harris at eight. So Najee Harris is going to be the pick for me there. I get my fifth overall player and my eighth overall player in rounds one and two. So I definitely like how that felt to me. And again, if that happens in my home league, I'm probably going to win. But I don't think Najee Harris is going to get to me to my first pick, let alone my second pick, because there's a lot of Steelers fans in my league. It's just insane to me that you had a your pick of the litter despite 10 running backs going off the board. You could either pick Najee Harris or Austin Eckler at that spot. Just absolutely phenomenal. And we're seeing Josh Jacobs go in the third round. Guys, don't do this. Honestly, he is absolutely not worth the pick, considering the fact that Allen Robinson, Mike Evans, CD Lamb, Amari Cooper, all those wide receivers are still on the board. And I know that your pick is going to end up being one of those guys. And I think I know which one it's going to be. Yeah, and J.K. Dobbins and Clyde edwards helaire to me, actually don't really belong to go in the third round either. I think they're more so late third, like the 3-4 turn is where I'd feel comfortable taking those guys because of what we've seen from Dobbins in the preseason with Gus Edwards. But overall, when I look at the board right now, obviously the top two tight ends or the top three tight ends are, are both off the board, so I can't go in that direction. I was hoping DeAndre Swift would make it back to me. James Robinson would definitely be a, a consideration for me at this pick because Currently, um, Montgomery Swift off the board. James Robinson would be my next highest rated running back. I definitely would consider going in that direction, but uh, CD Lamb, I have overall ranked the highest in terms of overall players. So I'm going to go with CD Lamb to anchor my wide receiver two spot. Yep. And I'm glad you mentioned that because, uh, uh, dude, I wanted CD Lamb, but again, that's what's going to happen. You're in a room with dra sharp drafters that know that CD Lamb is about to be the next. AJ Brown, the next Devontae Adams, the next elite superstar wide receiver. You're not going to get him at that 3-4 turn. I'm sorry. As much as I wanted that to happen, it's not going to. However, 
The next best thing, next best receiver on that team, I'm going to take Amari Cooper here. I don't think twice about that. The next pick is a dilemma because now I can look at it and say, do I want to go with a full zero RB or do I take the aforementioned James Robinson? That's really the dilemma here. If you think that James Robinson is going to get the 80% opportunity share that he got last year, if he's going to be a 20 touch per game back, he's perfectly fine to take your uh, right around the start of the dead zone. But if James Robinson is giving you that level of opportunity, that level of production, he's not necessarily in that prototypical dead zone profile. However, though, yeah, you know what? Let me let me spice it up. I never go with this guy, so I will take James Robinson there, but I heavily debated taking Mike Evans and just saying, screw the running back position. Right, and I think that's a good pick. I think when you guys, if you guys are wondering where you should take James Robinson, maybe your league isn't going to react quick enough to the news, and you don't know if, like who's going to be the one to pull the trigger on James Robinson, I would suggest pulling the trigger on James Robinson because I think he belongs to go in the early to mid third round. So if DeAndre Swift, David Montgomery, uh, and those guys are off the board, I would select James Robinson ahead of J.K. Dobbins. And I didn't think I would say that earlier in this offseason, but I would uh, at this point. I think he's going to get a 60, 70, 80% opportunity share, and this offense should be improved from what it was last year, should have more touchdown scoring opportunities. So James Robinson, as long as CeeDee Lamb, Terry McLaurin, some of these uh, elite wide receivers with elite upside are off the board, I'm okay taking James Robinson in the early to mid third round. So getting him at the 3-4 turn like you got him, I think is a good value. Uh, overall looking at the board right now, again, the running back position is just completely gross. I don't want Chris Carson. I don't want Miles Sanders. I don't like these players on my team. I think they're a hindrance to my roster. I think by far and away, the value is that wide receiver. I went with Julio Jones in the last video. He would be my highest rated wide receiver currently, but I'm going to go with Chris Godwin just to, for the sake of grabbing a different player. So I went with Chris Godwin there. He's my wide receiver three. I have Adam CD lamb and Chris Godwin as my top three receivers and an anchor RB in Najee Harris. So like I said, at the beginning of the video, this nine to 12 range, you can really go in a multitude of directions because I think the, the second best location, if you're not going to draft in the top three, I think the second best location to draft from is this nine to 11 range, because I think you're going to get either a great wide receiver falling to you like Devonte Adams or you're going to get the opportunity to pair a balanced approach, like a running back and a wide receiver, like the way I did it. Or you could go RB, RB, or you could go wide receiver, wide receiver. There's a lot of flexibility drafting at the end of the first round, in my opinion. Hey, the other strategy that you didn't mention is the one I inquired. If Travis Kelsey falls at the end of the first round, early second round area, I'm able to pair him with Stefan Diggs. Listen, Travis Kelsey, we know what he is. He's a tight end one in fantasy football. Last five years, he has been that guy. Number one weapon for Patrick Mahomes. If you're able to get that to really start off your draft, listen, we see the value of the tight end. There are already five tight ends off the board in the middle of the fifth round. If I can lock up Travis Kelsey and not worry about that position for the rest of my draft, I have an opportunity to absolutely get a positional edge that can compete with the Christian McCaffrey team. Because as good as Christian McCaffrey is, like Travis Kelsey, Stefan Diggs is an absolutely dynamic duo to combat that. So with that being said, uh, you're actually back on the clock here. What are you thinking? Yeah, I could go in a number of directions. I could go with a Dak Prescott at the 5-9 here because I do have CeeDee Lamb. It would be a nice upside swing there. I think I'm going to go with Brandon Ayuk because that presents just a huge, huge value. At the 5-9 five, five, for Brandon Ayuk, I have him ranked as my 47th overall player, so I would take him as as early as the, the, late, third, or the late fourth round. The fact that I'm going to be getting him here at the 5-9 is just absolutely absurd, so I'll, I'll definitely take him. I was kind of hoping TJ Hawkinson would fall back to me, so that's kind of unfortunate, but I like the value of uh, Ayuk there at the 5-9. Wait, so he's your 47th overall player? Yeah. Okay, he's my 38th overall player. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm absolutely in love with that pick. I am not in love with Team 11 going with Michael Thomas there in the fifth round. Listen, guys, do not step on that landmine this year. You're getting him for, what, eight weeks at most? And even so, he's going to be back at practice by week seven, week eight. That is just a complete landmine. You cannot afford to take that type of player. Where in reality here, look at all these wide receivers, Deontay Johnson, T. Higgins, guys like that that you can rely upon in your lineup right now. You don't have to wait seven weeks of production for them. And could, could Michael Thomas end up being a top three, top four wide receiver when he comes back? Absolutely. But even at that ceiling, it does not supplement taking over guys that, in my opinion, have top 15 type ceilings with Deontay and T. Higgins. So, don't be that guy that steps on the Michael Thomas land nine. I know he has a big name. Don't do it. But anyways, you mentioned you were, you were thinking about Dak Prescott. That is absolutely going to be one of the picks here. Listen, if I'm only going to go with one running back in these first six rounds, I want to be elite at the other positions. I want to be elite at tight end. I have Travis Kelsey. I have two elite wide receivers, specifically Stefan Diggs and Amari Cooper, who I think can go into that back end of the wide receiver one range. 
Getting Dak Prescott here to complement that, I think is phenomenal. Also gives me the stack with Amari. And then pairing that with, as I mentioned, Deontay Johnson versus T. Higgins is a close call. I took T, uh, Deontay Johnson in our draft the other night. So I'm going to go T. Higgins here. I think it's a very close call. You can go either way there. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that's a bad idea for sure. Um, all right, so I'm back on the clock here, and I have a pretty tough decision to make because we've already talked about this on a couple occasions before, but the one exception to the RB dead zone is these elite upside rookie running backs, and I'm very tempted to take Javante Williams here, but I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to take a running back here because I need a running back. Instead, I'm going to take the best available player on the board, and to me, that is by far and away Chase Claypool. So I'm going to take Chase Claypool here. It, if Chase Claypool wasn't off the board, I definitely would have taken Javante Williams. And I think that is a, if you're going to go with a hero RB or an anchor RB strategy, getting Javante Williams in the sixth, seventh round is a great way to help give yourself some ceiling late in the season. Cause if you can get by with Naeem Hines, JD McKissick, uh, Zach Moss, Damian Harris, whoever you have to get as your RB two, and you have Javante Williams in your back pocket and you already have a stack team everywhere else, then that is going to be a very, very good thing for you to to basically reap the rewards of late in the season. I also think if you do go hero RB, Javante Williams is a good uh, trade target for you in week three, week four, if he's underperforming as well. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. They're a phenomenal pick and yeah, good job. Yep. So looking at the board, I mean, I don't want to just be recycling the same players we're taking in all these videos, but I think the clear pick to me is Damian Harris. Like I, Damian Harris at this point, I'm okay taking a running back. I skipped over the RB dead zone that three to rounds three to uh, six range. I get past the RB de dead zone and I get Damian Harris at seven, nine to anchor my RB two slot. I have a absolutely stacked wide receiver core where I'm going to be able to start Devonte Adams, CD lamb, Chris Godwin, Brandon, I, you can chase Claypool every single week. That is going to be my starting wide receiver. So that is just crazy production for me. All, all five of those guys are inside of my top 20 this year. Yeah, no, that, that, that is absolutely crazy value there uh, that you were able to start with. For me, I am back on the clock here. And listen, you mentioned taking a Damian Harris as a good solidified RB2 for this lineup. I see Trey Sermon as that same, that good goal line back. And I think we took him in each of the last two videos, but I really don't care. If Trey Sermon's a seventh, eighth round pick in your home leagues, go scoop him up there. I believe he not only returns on value on that, but I think he's got a really good chance to be a top 15, 20 running back. We saw Jeff Wilson over these last couple of years be a very good, very efficient goal line back. I think Trey Sermon is not only going to do that, but also contribute in maybe not a three down role, but contribute in the early downs, contribute in between the twenties, contribute in the passing game. He's got a good overall skill set to be able to do so. And again, I imagine Raheem Moser, 29 year old running back under 300 total touches in his career. The people that are citing him as this elite real life running back, go, go see someone. That's not, that's not even remotely the case, but uh, Trey Sermon, there you go. And then uh, Devonta Smith to round out my team and, I absolutely love the spot. Like if you have the 12 spot, this team is phenomenal. Yeah. And I was really, really hoping Carter would get to me there because that way I could pair us. What I consider a floor play as my RB two with Damian Harris and then at a ceiling play with Carter. And then that way I'm really not missing out on anything. And I got all these elite wide receivers in the mid round. So what I don't have, unfortunately in this kind of hero RB build is a positional advantage at quarterback or at tight end. So I'm a little bit upset that Noah Fant didn't fall to me with my last pick. He definitely would have been in consideration for me at the 7-9. I don't see really a reason to, to reach on a tight end here. Robert Tunyon's definitely encouraging and, and kind of uh, piques my interest a little bit. Actually, you know what? I am going to go with Robert Tunyon because I have a lot of great wide receivers. I could have gone with Will Fuller there, but Robert Tunyon to me is a little bit of a tear break at the tight end position. He's the last tight end that I feel really comfortable with starting each and every week. I'm not the biggest guy on Tyler Higby, but he would probably be kind of close in that conversation. Um, so overall, I like my team. I kind of wish I would have had an opportunity to get a quarterback or a tight end at some point. I could have gone with Dak Prescott at the 5'9", I suppose, but to me, the Brandon Ayuk value was just absolutely too good to pass on. So overall, when I look at my team, I'm going to have to fill out my quarterback position later in the draft. As we've talked about on numerous occasions, if I don't get a Ryan Tannehill or a Tom Brady, which it looks like some of these guys are off the board, these uh, tier three quarterbacks, I would grab a Kirk Cousins, I would grab a Justin Fields, I'd grab a Trey Lance so that I have a good mix of ceiling and floor and I would be able to um, you know, work my roster that way. But the wide receivers on my team are going to be the, the catalyst. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree there. So we can transition to our next draft and that's going to be with me drafting at the uh, 10 slot and Corey drafting at the 11 spot. So, okay, so we'll you guys see can there. see I'm set up in my spot, Corey and his, and we will initialize this draft. 
Christian McCaffrey, Dalvin Cook, Derrick Henry, Alvin Kamara, Ezekiel Elliott, Saquon Barkley, Nick Chubb, Tyreek Hill, and Jonathan Taylor all off the board here. And should I supplement Tyreek Hill with Devontae Adams? I just I think I think you should. We've taken Devontae Adams in a number of these. I mean, uh, okay, we'll just say Aaron Jones got off the board there then. Okay, so you guys should see on the board right now, pretty st- typical start thus far. I had to make the adjustment. Uh, the computer wouldn't let me put Devontae Adams in for any reason. They just kept autoing back to Jonathan Taylor. So, yeah, I don't think that uh, Devontae Adams is going to make it to your 110, but if he does, don't think twice about it unless, you know, Chris McCaffrey's on the board, Alvin Kamara's on the board. I mean, you know, you're just drafting with a bunch of dummies. But, yeah, uh, we're on the clock here at 110, and my highest-ranked player, as I mentioned, is going to be Tyree Kill. So, I'll take him here, feeling confident about that, and exactly what I did in my home league. Right. So, looking at the board right now, currently, I believe my highest-ranked player is, yeah, it's Najee Harris. So, it looks like I'm going to be taking Najee Harris again, but... He's currently my highest ranked player. He is the um, the way I would go. I think with the 111 slot, and Arnold, if you're listening to this, because he is in the league and he picks 111, I think the best route to go probably is double RB because I think the value is going to line up that you're going to be able to get two of Aaron Jones, Najee Harris, Austin Eckler, Antonio Gibson, or Jonathan Taylor. I think that's probably what you're going to be looking at. And I would, pr- I would imagine that Devontae Adams, Tyree Killer, both off the board. Travis Kelsey also probably off the board as well. So... Being able to go RBRB definitely is, uh, I think it's a good strategy at the 111, 112 range. Yeah, no, I fully agree there. So who are you thinking at this 202? Or do I even need to ask, you know, does he wear red on Sundays? Yeah, he does. It's Antonio Gibson. It's a pretty easy pick for me. I think that is uh, that is definitely the direction I would go with the 111 if faced with that kind of board. Stephon Diggs definitely in consideration for me there. But Antonio Gibson is the last running back that I would select before I would select this, uh, Stephon Diggs. I'm glad you mentioned that Stefan Diggs is in consideration there because that's going to be the pick. He's my eighth overall player. Tyree Kills, my seventh overall player. So from a pure value standpoint, I'm getting two top eight players at the 110 and the 203. I am feeling very, very ecstatic about the start to my draft. If I were to do this in real life, I just missed out on Stefan Diggs by one pick in my real life draft. So that's big Sag. Right. And I have Najee Harris as my seventh overall player. Antonio Gibson as my 11th overall player. So I actually do have them higher than I have Stefan Diggs, who I have at 12. So that's kind of just a value discrepancy between the way me and you view the first round. That's why we kind of went in different directions there. So what are you thinking with this next pick? Yeah, and uh, I'm going to stick the zero RB. See, Lamps, clear top player left on the board. So I'm going to take him. And Terry McLaurin's next in consideration, who I'm assuming you're going to take there. Yeah, I would love to take uh, James Robinson and go robust RB here, but I'm not going to take James Robinson for the 70th straight mock draft. So yes, Terry McLaurin is my highest rated wide receiver. I'll go with Terry McLaurin there. I was hoping Mike Evans would fall back to me, but he did not. Uh, Looking at the board, there's nothing that really interests me at quarterback. Kyle Pitts, I think it's a little too early based on the wide receivers available. So I'm going to go actually in the direction that you went, and I'm going to go with Amari Cooper as my second wide receiver there. It sounds like Amari Cooper is back to full health. By the sounds of it, it doesn't sound like his ankle, foot, whatever he was dealing with is giving him any problems. So I'm okay taking him right exactly where I would take CeeDee Lamb, which is like the early to mid third round range. And I got him at the three or the 412 or the 402. So definitely like that. Yep, I fully agree here. And uh, that that's a bother for me because that was like, quote unquote, last tier three type of wide receiver. In my opinion, I have uh, Amari Cooper and Terry McLaurin personally in that uh, next year. So I kind of got, you know, a, a little flustered there, but. Regardless, the next year obviously would be Julio Jones, Chris Godwin, Robert Woods, those type of guys. But the guy that I would be fine and comfortable with selecting amongst those wide receivers, especially after having this three wide receiver start, is getting that positional edge at tight end. I know you mentioned it's a little too early for Kyle Pitts in your opinion. I think this is appropriate value. Listen, if this guy hits his ceiling, which is what we draft in fantasy football, we draft for ceiling, he could be drafted within the top 15, top 16 picks by next year. This is the level of talent. This is the level of target opportunity in that system. And he's already been turning heads in training camp. This is a guy who Coach <laughs> Coach Smith has basically mentioned as being a versatile weapon rather than a tight end in that offense. And I know this is a microanalysis. I keep saying that every freaking video, but man, give me Kyle Pitts and I'm not thinking twice. Yeah, I, I don't hate the value there. I think I have Chris Godwin and I have Julio Jones uh, pretty significantly, like four or five spots ahead of Kyle Pitts. So I would have went in that direction. But I mean, you do have a lot of wide receivers. It's it's understandable to go in the direction of tight end. So hopefully, let's see what's fallen back to you here. I know you're probably looking for Dak Prescott. Oh, I just jinxed it. Yeah, I was hoping for Dak Prescott or the best available wide receiver here. And you know who that is. 
Again, you mentioned he was your 47th overall player, but uh, I believe you misspoke. He's actually your 38th. He's also my 38th. That's Brandon Ayuk. Yep. Yeah. Right on. Right on cue there. And again, we. <laughs> There's only so many mock drafts we can do where we're t- picking the same players over and over again because we are drafting based on our rankings. And it seems, you know, the way we see it, we're going to end up with a lot of exposure to some of these guys because they go a little bit after where we have them ranked. So looking at the board right now, uh, I think it's pretty obvious which direction I'm going to go in. Yeah, I have Chase Claypool rated as my highest weight overall wide receiver. So I'm going to go with Chase Claypool. And the guy that I was contemplating between Chase Claypool also fell back to me and T Higgins. So I am going to go with those two guys. Again, this is a beautiful start to a uh, uh, 11th overall pick, in my opinion. Arnold, you, take notes. <laughs> yeah, you get you get two anchor running backs like that, Najee Harris and Antonio Gibson, and you're able to pair them with the four stack of wide receivers that I just got, Terry McLaurin, Amari Cooper, Chase Claypool, and T. Higgins, all to fill out your wide receiver and your flexes. That is an excellent start to the draft, in my opinion. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And uh, I, I love your start, and I'm going to love my start after – you mentioned multiple times potentially getting Javante Williams. This is the build you want, Javante Williams. Listen, I am going to be at an advantage at the wide receiver, the flex, and the tight end. Taking that upside RB1 in the dead zone is the only way to combat the dead zone. I think if Javante Williams at his ceiling, we could see a Jonathan Taylor finish. We could see uh, that Cam Akers-esque type of player. And yeah, like that, absolutely. If you're taking that guy in the dead zone, that's the only way that you can actually combat it. You're not going to be taking the cream hunts, the Miles Gaskins. You're going to shoot for RB1 upside. Javante Williams, uh, Javante Williams absolutely has an abundance. Right. And James Robinson, again, if he would already be off the board at this yeah, point, otherwise he would have been the pick. So we don't want to just yeah. pick James Robinson over and over again. Yeah. Like it's, it's sleepers going to update their ADP. Don't worry. Yeah. But again, if you are drafting this weekend, make sure you take advantage of James Robinson's ADP. If you can get him anywhere outside the third round, I think that's great value on him. So Trey Sermon went off the board and so did Noah Fant. I was actually hoping Fant would fall to me. I'm assuming you wanted Trey Sermon to fall to you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I wanted Trey Sermon uh, to be there, but um, I'm fine, honestly. Like I could go with a Michael Carter here. That's probably somebody I would hope to get on the wraparound because I do think after this range of wide receiver, we kind of see not a drop off, but because I still like the guys, but I do think that's just a little bit of a tear there between a Robbie Anderson, Devonta Smith versus even like, the Jalen Waddle, Brandon Cooks, Jarvis Landry type of area. So I will take Robbie Anderson here, and I'm assuming you're going to go with Devonta Smith. Uh, yeah, looking at my team right now, I really wanted Noah Fant to fall back to me. He unfortunately did not. So I'm probably not going to be going with a tight end uh, for the rest of this kind of draft here. I don't have any – I kind of want to take a quarterback in this range of the draft, but I don't really like the value right now. I kind of wish Tom Brady would have fallen to me, but he did not. So I am going to go with Devonte Smith. To me, he's the – best overall player on the board. So I went with him comes back to me and Michael Carter did actually go off the board. So you're not going to get him with your next pick. I'm uh, I'm looking at the running back position. I'm not overly excited about taking a Leonard Fournette or a Zach Moss at this point, because I do have those two anchor RBs that are going to be in my starting lineup every single week. I don't really need to draft a guy like Zach Moss, who is like an RB two type RB three even on a a given week, that's more so the type of running back that you're probably going to be targeting. So I'm going to go with another upside shot. Probably, uh, you know what, actually I'm going to take a quarterback. I'm going to go with Ryan Tannehill here. I think that's a a good, good value on a quarterback that I think realistically Ryan Tannehill could lead the NFL at passing touchdowns. And I don't think anybody's talking about it. The fact that he has AJ Brown and Julio Jones to throw to and defenses are keyed in on Derrick Henry, just in all around going to be some great efficiency from that Titans offense, which shouldn't be news to anybody. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree there. That was a very good selection. And man, I was banking on Trey Sermon. That kind of hurts. But you mentioned Zach Moss's name. And typically, if this was longer than eighth round, eight rounds, I do believe I can get him in the ninth. But for simplicity's sake, for the video's sake, I do think Zach Moss is a fine selection here. Listen, he's been dominating Bill's camp. He's looked like their RB1 so far. So getting a guy like that, and then I can shoot for upside later on with the Tony Pollards, with uh, guys like that, even like Sony Michelle, now that he's on the Rams, I mean, maybe he gets a good change of pace type of role. We saw he was a very, actually a very efficient wider or not wide receiver, but receiver out of the backfield for the Patriots last year after being pigeonholed into that first and second down role to start his career. So those are type of options you can go from rounds 10, 11, 12, 13, not even mentioning a guy like AJ Dillon, but uh, yeah, speaking a little, a little, a little bit of a tangent there, but Zach Moss is the best pick on the board in my opinion. And that kind of wraps it up. Listen, somebody's going to watch this. The Cowboys are going to watch this and say, how can you go into the season with that RB cord? Are you not scared? I'm not scared. And the reason why is because of the names Tyree Kill, Stefan Diggs, CeeDee Lamb, 
Kyle Pitts, and you can read the rest of the team. You take the value, and that is the value that laid out for me. Yeah, and again, we always say this all the time. If somebody doesn't have an elite wide receiver and they see C.D. Lamb go out week one and drop like a 30 bomb, which won't happen because he's playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but if that were to happen, they might offer you a DeAndre Swift for C.D. Lamb. And in that case, maybe you want to pivot and go for a running back at that point. Maybe you want to trade him for a David Montgomery. Maybe you can even get a Jonathan Taylor for him after a down week one or something. Somebody might panic sell you a, a better running back than the wide receiver that you took. So the the moral of the story, if you guys have watched all three of these early round strategies videos, the moral of the story is in the early rounds, you take the best available players, no matter what position they're at, because you can always, there's multiple ways to skin a cat. You can win a championship with four running backs. You can win a championship with four wide receivers. You can win a championship with two wide receivers, an elite quarterback and a tight end. There's really no one formula for how to win a championship in fantasy. The formula to win a championship in fantasy is to pick the best players. So don't be pigeonholed. Don't be forced into feeling like you have to take three running backs in the first three rounds or four running backs in the first five rounds. You need to pick the best available players. Yeah, no, I fully agree there. Again, a lot of analysis on YouTube, on Twitter, on podcasts. There is a lot of, I don't want to say casual analysis, but there are people out there saying, oh, well, the RB scarcity, you just want to pound running back, running back, running back, running back. And in reality here, yeah, cool. You're getting scarcity at the running back position, but you're not getting elite difference making talent. If I'm taking a running back, I want to make sure he has the ability to have a 20 point per game ceiling. If I'm taking him within the first 15, 16, 17 picks of my draft, I do think Tyree Kill, Stefan Diggs are not only safer picks, but better picks. I mean, look, as much as I love Jonathan Taylor, he is a very, very good running back, an elite running back. And at his ceiling, okay, maybe he hits it, but the range of outcomes here, realistically, even Jonathan Taylor at his ceiling is probably a slightly better version of Nick Chubb, probably the RB4, RB5 on the season. And as good as that is, Tyree Kill and Stefan Diggs both have a case for the wide receiver one overall this year. Right. And speaking purely on fantasy points, we're talking about Jonathan Taylor, who averaged 15.7 PPR fantasy or half PPR fantasy points last year. Tyreek Hill has 21, 22 half PPR fantasy points in his range of outcomes because he's in an offense that can allow him to score 16 touchdowns next year. Like it's, it's, it's a possibility that that can happen. And like we said, you always want to shoot for ceiling. You always want to pick the best available player. Tyreek Hill, Stephon Diggs, these guys are going to go undervalued in your drafts because I mean, you saw it in the ADP. Christian McCaffrey, Dalvin Cook, Derrick Henry, Alvin Kamara, Zeke Elliott, Barkley, Chubb, Jones, eight straight running backs to start your draft. And I'm willing to bet most home league draft boards will have 15, 20 running backs in the first two rounds. Easily, easily. And I've seen multiple home leagues will have legitimately 25 running backs within the first four rounds, 30 running backs within the first five rounds. Like it's people love their running backs. There's running back thirst constantly in your home leagues. And how do you combat that? Listen, if everybody's going one way, when they're zigging, you freaking zag, baby. You get these elite wide receivers when Devontae Adams falls to you at your 110 because the first nine picks all went running back. Like it, I've genuinely seen that happen before and capitalized. That's all I can say. Yep. Yeah. So if you guys did enjoy this video, as always, hit the like button down below. Comment any of your thoughts down below as well. Anything that you liked about our draft, any questions that you have. I'm, you know, if you're picking at the 10 slot and you maybe want some more specific advice based on your own league's tendencies, we'd be happy to help you out in the comment section and subscribe to the channel. If you're new, what are you waiting for? We're putting out like two videos a day right here. This is totally free for you guys to view. You got to watch a couple ads here and there, but other than that, this is the best fantasy football content on YouTube. And I a hundred percent believe that because I think we put the work in. I think we have real, you know, researched analysis. So if you are new to the channel, this is the first time you're checking out a video of ours, please hit the subscribe button and go check out our other videos. I promise you, you will never watch another fantasy football YouTube channel again. For sure. And if you want to have any other way to support us, go on Underdog Fantasy right now. Use promo code FSC at checkout. You'll get an extra $25 to play with on Underdog Fantasy app on your $10 deposit, as well as access to both of our draft guides, redraft guide, and of course, the Dynasty content you guys have all been subscribed for all off season. That is all available just for depositing $10 and getting extra money to play with. And you can win the money. You can win money with the $10 that you spent and you get, we made reference to our rankings all the way throughout this video. If you guys want to know exactly who we would draft, then you can get our rankings and use those rankings in your draft. Maybe you're a more casual fantasy football player and you're just willing to trust our rankings. That's fine too. You can also see our sleepers, our busts, our breakouts. We talked about a number of them in this video, namely Brandon Ayuk and Chase Claypool, but Yeah, that's exactly what you're going to be getting if you use underdogfantasy.com.
All right, guys, stay tuned for next week. Next week, we're coming at you with the fun stuff, the superlatives. We're coming at you with our top five busts. Each of us is going to do a list, top five busts, top five breakouts, top five sleepers. We're also going to go through 10 players that we're going to draft at each position based on whatever we just like their must draft players at quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end. So a big action packed week. We're almost there. We're almost there. It's like the NFL season kicks off with my Buccaneers versus your Cowboys like two weeks from now, like two and a half weeks from now. So we're pumped. We're ready to go. Peace out, guys, and enjoy your Friday. Why, why you need the money?